Hey everyone, I'm Catherine from Nutshell, and joining us once again, fresh off his appearance at Boundless 2020, is ProfitWell co-founder and CEO, Patrick Campbell. Patrick, thanks so much for being here. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's been, been a good time so far. So you covered a lot of retention tips during your Boundless keynote, um, but there's a point that I think deserves some deeper discussion, and that's the connection between understanding your buyers and retaining your buyers. So first of all, um, you mentioned that the traditional buyer personas are ineffective, they're too general, and they don't tell you what your buyers actually value. So what should a buyer persona actually look like? What information is essential and what is just noise? Yeah, it's a really good question. I think the, the funny thing about buyer personas is they're, they're really well-intentioned, right? You know, it's kind of like... Um, you know, if you don't have anything, but then you create these like cute little avatars and cute little names um, like Startup Steve and things like that, it's actually super useful. But I think that for a lot of us, like because of where the market's gone and because of the density that we're now in, it's really important to kind of take it a step further. And, and where I think a lot of buyer personas go wrong is one, they follow too closely one framework over another. So you have like profiles, you have jobs to be done, you have buyer personas, you have all these different things. And I think that all of them have their strengths. And so you should, you know, essentially use the strengths of each of them. Um, and you almost want to treat these like a constitution within your company. So what I mean by that is, um, you know, this is where you can argue about, hey, we're going to build this feature, um, you know, well, wait a minute, that's not for Startup Steve. And we said we were going to focus on Startup Steve. And so that's the big thing I think we get wrong about buyer personas is we just kind of think, oh, let's just, you know, do them and we'll get all the benefits. And in reality, you have to actually use them like, like most things in, in building a business. But I think if we get really deep, where we miss out with our buyer personas is oftentimes we don't make them specific enough. So a lot of times it, it's exactly like I said, where you get into a room and you just kind of argue about who these profiles are and really they, they need to be, have a lot of data. Um, now the data is basically validating those assumptions you have because you know something about your buyers. And so what I recommend doing is, you know, quite literally just having a spreadsheet in your business. Maybe it's a Google sheet across the columns. You basically have, you know, the different profiles and you separate those out based on you know size or role or you know anything and then along the rows have things like what are the most valued features of that persona what are the least valued features what is the willingness to pay what are your unit economics like LTV CAC these types of things and then add whatever you think is relevant for your business um, some folks put in NPS some folks put in you know support you know utilization you can add a bunch of different things but it should be like a living and breathing document um, that you use to kind of centralize where you're targeting and where you're not um, but I think those are those are the big things is you know you don't use them you got to use them they got to be that constitution and then two, making them specific enough and, and data validated. And, you know, you're not going to be able to validate everything all the time, but you at least kind of have that central point. It allows you to kind of build um, and actually, you know, make use of them. Yeah, I love that analogy to the Constitution. That's really a great way to think about it. Um, so we yeah. know that uh, talking to more customers is the silver bullet, um, but the majority of SaaS companies simply don't do it enough. So can you take us through it? What customers should we talk to and when should we talk to them? Yeah, that's a great question. And I think it's, it's something that I've struggled with for, you know, the better part of a decade now, because it's, you know, it's kind of like, why don't we eat our Brussels sprouts? You know, well, because we didn't, you know, we didn't know that we should soak them in bacon basically or whatever. I don't know. That metaphor is not going to work out. But anyway, so I think it's one of those things that we we could be, we were able to be lazy, you know, 10, 15, 20 years ago because there just wasn't as much software out there. There just wasn't as much, you know, product out there. There were a lot of marketing channels that we could use. And now we, we can't be lazy as much anymore because there's a lot of products. There's not as many marketing or there, there's a lot of marketing channels, but everyone's using them now. And so I think that what what's really important about you know, thinking about your customer research is making sure that it's just a part of your DNA. And what I mean by that is a lot of companies, they, they start to struggle and then they go, oh, like, let's do some research, right? And then they have this 45 question survey that they email to someone. And the first question is, oh, what's your email address, right? And this is why we hate surveys. This is why we hate like helping people give research and give feedback is because 
we're pretty terrible at trying to collect feedback. And so I think it's one of those things where you have to make it part of your DNA where, you know, if you have that buyer persona document or you have just a repository where you put this research, literally just making sure that like, hey, when people churn, we ask them why. Um, hey, when people sign up, we ask them why. Um, hey, when we're going to build something, we make sure that we go out and we talk to a few people about what we're going to build, right? And just making that part of the DNA because then what you start to find is you start to hone in on, you know, kind of the answer to your question, which is like, who should you talk to? How should you talk to them? Well, it's going to depend on like what you're trying to figure out. But more often than not, it's, you know, people who have never heard of you, but who are your target customers? You know, these are like market panelists that you can get access to. Um, they're people who are prospects who have not converted yet. And then ultimately your customers across, you know, cohorts of how long they've been around. And so I think that's, that's really what to think about is, is depending on the question you're asking, that's going to determine who you're going to talk to. But ultimately, it's about making sure this is part of your DNA because you want to make sure you have that research when you're when you want to make an action not oh gosh we have to like reinvent the wheel to go figure out like how we should you know get the right research because what you end up doing then is just building the thing and just putting it out there which is not the right way to build stuff anymore yeah that's that's great it's like each um, point there is part of the customer journey and when you understand the customer journey, you understand when you do need to reach out to those people and have those conversations. Um, so you um, touched a little bit on um, surveying, but do you have any other thoughts on how those conversations should be structured and what kind of questions you should ask and what information are you really trying to learn? Yeah, 100%. I think that, you know, it, it comes down to it's, you know, I, I suggested, hey, here's a bunch of places where, you know, when people churn, when they sign up, these types of things. I think when you're having like a one-on-one -on -one conversation, um, or even if you're doing like more scalable outreach through a survey, like how you ask these questions is super, super important. Um, and I think a lot of us, we you know, lead the witness, as they say, you know, we lead the witness a little bit too much because we just want to build the thing and we have an instinct or we have that one support ticket that said we should build this thing or we should implement this feature or whatever we should do. And so what it really comes down to <laughs> is making sure that you um, are almost like a prosecuting attorney. You know, you can't lead the witness. You have to ask those questions. And it's not a sales conversation either. Although you can do some research in sales, um, you're talking to them and you're saying like, hey, tell me about that. Tell me about, you know, what do you find valuable? What's keeping you up at night? What's terrible for you? What's great for you, right? These types of open-ended questions can then kind of hone in on more specific questions where, you know, I might start, you know, asking you questions about, you know, the software we're using to run this, um, you know, this, this uh, Q&A here. And you might give me, well, you know, it's good or it's bad because of X, Y, Z. And then that gives me a little bit of a, um, a little bit of, um, you know, background information then go, okay, so you mentioned these five things. What's the most important out of that list? What's the least important out of that list? And that gives, you know, us basically understanding where I'm forcing you to kind of make a decision, right? So I've gone from kind of open-ended, like really trying to understand and then gone to, hey, like make a decision out of these things that you said were important to you. And then there's plenty of different ways you can ask, you know, pricing questions and things like that. But I think the big thing is making sure you're not leading the witness. And ultimately, you're also not asking like, hey, what do you want, right? And that might be a valuable question for, for some cases, but oftentimes that, you know, people aren't thinking about the problem enough. They're thinking about their problem. And so you need to filter that data. And that's why you need to ask a little bit more kind of these circuitous questions, if that makes sense. Yeah. So are there any other ways to obtain this kind of information besides customer conversations? Um, obviously, those one-to-one -one conversations or surveying could be a really effective method. But if you're a brand new startup or a new company, you might not have a lot of customers to talk to at first. Totally. And I think that's, that's what's really funny is that I, I hear this all the time, right? And it's, it's a totally valid question. But it's one of those things where it's like, if you can't find people to talk to you, you're probably not gonna be able to find customers, right? You know, cause it's the same kind of like concept, right? And in the early days, you're scrappy, you're trying to figure out like, I'm just gonna talk to anyone who thinks that this is a relevant problem, right? Um, and so I think it's one of those things where, you know, don't necessarily think of it as like a separate in engagement. Think of it as like, hey, I wanna make sure I can attract these types of people and I might need to get intros or I might need to do X, Y, or Z. Now, I will say to kind of like speed things up, um, to give you a really practical answer, um, I mentioned it before, but there's this entire 
entire world of what are known as market panel companies. Um, and these companies, their entire existence is to get you in front of a you know, soccer mom or dad in the middle of Kansas, all the way to you know, a Fortune 500 CIO in South Africa. Um, and they get you in front of those folks to basically answer questions, either on a phone call um, or you know, via a survey. Um, and they cost you know, very different amounts of money. You know, the soccer mom or dad is going to be much, much cheaper than the Fortune 500 CIO. Um, but it's one of those things where you can get really quick research and get really, really quick information information um, in a relatively, you know, cheap way. Um, I think when we were validating um, one of our products that we came out with, um, so this is when we came out with Profile Metrics for the first time, um, we collected, I think it was like 350 responses um, and we, um, you know, spent maybe $2,000, which, you know, when you're early stage, $2,000 is a lot of money, but you have to kind of think about like how much information you're going to get back. And, and for us, it saved us like 18 months um, of, of going in the wrong direction. And we actually were able to go in the right direction. So that's kind of what I would use. But then the other thing to kind of think about is, you know, survey data or even customer data is not the only data that you should be focused on. Um, there's a lot of market data, trend data that you should be looking at. Um, I love to look at like... Um, I can't remember exactly what it's called, but like Google Z Insights, I think it used to be called, where you can kind of search like what's the popularity of terms or these types of things over time. Um, and then of course, like really good market and benchmark data is, is you know, powerful to understand like the trends of where things are going. Um, but I would say that like no data is um, without bias and no data is like slam dunk, right? You need to kind of combine some of these data points to, you know, earn your paycheck and, you know, put together a thesis of what you should be doing, whether, you know, you're trying to acquire more customers, trying to build your product, or just trying to, you know, validate the business in general. That's really great. Um, thanks, Patrick. So um, changing gears a little bit, you've spoken about time to value as a huge indicator of retention. Um, that's something that we focus on at Nutshell as well, making sure sales teams quickly get fired up to use our product. Um, so what are some of the specific ways you can use the information you learn from these customer conversations to improve time to value? Yeah, that's a great question. I think you have to think about, so there's a lot of things, right? There's super tactical pieces and then there's like strategic bits here. And I think a lot of the strategic parts are, you know, stuff we've already talked about, like understanding who your buyers are, but also understanding like what are the things that they really value from like a value proposition? What do they care about? So when you're thinking of like a CRM, you know, do they care about, you know, the hardcore security and certifications and all these things? And they're probably going to go to like an enterprise CRM or do they care about it being lightweight and designed well and, and these types of things. And that's going to be a different type of persona. Right. And so this is the hard path is like knowing your research and then making sure that your, you know, sales or sales teams are enabled by having those conversations or your marketing is enabled by, Hey, like we should focus on this conversation. I mean, we found this out where, you know, we were focusing a little too much on, you know, kind of startup communication. Um, we ourselves, we have thousands of startups using Profile right now, but um, they're using the free product and we don't really target them for the paid product. And so a lot of our marketing started going towards them because that's where we were getting signal. And we had to do our research to be like, no, 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 no. We aren't focusing on these folks. We need to talk this way for, for the upmarket folks that we were targeting. And then all of a sudden there's tons of tactics, right? And so I would say the tactics don't work unless you're, you know, you kind of know your research at least a little bit. Um, but there's plenty of things you can do where, um, I know it sounds a little counterintuitive, but doing things like an onboarding and training, um, even if you don't charge for it, right? It's one of those things where, um, you know, I would recommend actually charging for it. And I know that, again, that sounds counterintuitive, but even for a somewhat touchless product, you know, that's something that you can discount. You know, you don't have to discount the actual subscription. It's something that you can, you know, actually improve retention considerably. And we've seen this in the data, mainly because what it allows you to do is it allows you to essentially take the, the user and make sure they're trained on what they should do. And when you have those conversations, you can kind of like, you know, understand, oh, they keep asking about this thing. I can show them where that thing is inside the product. And, you know, a purist in me would say, well, your product should just naturally show them, you know, where that thing is that you should, you know, that they want. But, you know, even if you're using things like app queues and some of the other products out there, sometimes it's really difficult to like, you know, you have thousands of different types of users who might be using your product. Um, some other cool things, and, and maybe I'll round out with this one, is like playing with the term. Um, so how long you know, the contract is um, or how long the, the term is for the customer. And it's a little counterintuitive, but um, HubSpot was a really good example, especially in the early days, where what they did with their marketing product 
is they basically forced you onto an annual contract. And that definitely affected conversion rates. Um, but what was important about it is they were trying to basically teach people this brand new world of inbound marketing. Um, and that's really tough to do. And they realized like, hey, once we get someone to write like a blog post or two and get some leads, you know, they're customers for life. And the hard part about that is like some people, they're going to take three months to get that blog post written, right? And so they basically forced a longer term contract, which gave them the time to essentially, you know, get that person evangelized and get them, you know, really into the product. Um, and then like, I'll do a bonus one here. I know I said that was the last one. I think integrations are super powerful. And, and one of those things that people don't realize are as powerful as they are. Um, and what I mean by this is like, imagine Nutshell is synced with every single tool I have. Um, and it's not necessarily my source of truth, but it's source of some of my truth, right? Like my contacts or something like that. Um, all of a sudden, if that is the case, ripping that out becomes a really, really big like, you know, endeavor. And maybe I'm unhappy. I, of course, I would never be unhappy with Nutshell, but you know, maybe I'm unhappy with like one aspect or you know, I was having a bad day or something like that. But even if that's the case, it gives me a, a little bit of a barrier to be like, all right, ripping this out is just going to be way too complicated. And then it allows me to like see and continue to see that value. So hopefully those are a couple of, of good pieces. And I always, I'm always fearful, like I get going, I'm like, am I answering the question? So hopefully that answers the question here. Yeah, I think so. And it speaks to a little bit to almost helping to um, motivate your new customers and give them a, a reason to really invest their time into making sure they're learning the important things they need to learn about your product. Totally. Wow. And some folks, what they do, not, not to cut back in, but like they'll even give incentives for reaching certain milestones and onboarding. And, and that gets a little onerous because it's like, you know, it's, it's not about the, like the, like reaching the milestone. It's more about them internalizing like the value, but we've seen that work with kind of mixed results in, in B2B SaaS where, you know, people will give that incentive where it might be like a free onboarding or something like that. If they, you know, add 10 people by a certain date or these types of things. And so, yeah, it's something to kind of think about. Yeah. So thinking a little bit um, longer term, although this could be relevant at any stage, um, and this is something you mentioned as well. So for SaaS companies, uh, the average NPS scores have been falling over time despite massive technical advancements in product. Um, there's so much product out there that our customers have, as um, you put it, become a little bit ungrateful. So what is the solution? <laughs> is it about just weeding out the users who are more likely to have a bad experience with your company? Yeah, it's interesting. So I think it's, I actually don't think this is necessarily a bad thing, but it's something that you have to kind of react to because I think, you know, it's, I'm, I'm being a little cheeky when I say they're ungrateful because I think your customers are, are, you know, there's plenty of grateful customers. I think they just expect a heck of a lot more than they once did, right? You know, if you think about, you know, I, I, I'm not an OG of software, but, you know, when you talk to people who were selling, you know, 20, 30 years ago in the really early days of SaaS and, and more so in the perpetual license days, you know, you could pretty much put like a login screen on a database and you were like a god, right? Because they, they never like had software before. And then all of a sudden you're giving them software. And I think today it's just, you know, we we've lost a lot of that magic. And, you know, if you look at some of the really successful or the, the products that are really growing really quickly right now, like, you know, Superhuman or Notion or these types of things, they're, they're no longer like technologically advancing things. They're kind of taking existing ideas. They're doing really, really good UX and really good UI design. And then there's, there's some innovations, but it's not like, oh, this is the first file sync and share product that ever existed, or this is the first wiki that ever existed, which was kind of mind blowing if you can kind of put yourself back in the shoes of someone who'd buy those products. And so long story short, I think that you know, NPS is just down overall because, you know, we've lost that magic, but I will say that it, it's still a really good signal to understand, you know, and, and kind of use it to see who those good customers and who those bad customers are. And it's not to say that, you know, someone who has a bad NPS is a bad customer, but it, it is, you know, something where you can look at as you were alluding to with, hey, every time we sign up someone who is, you know, a healthcare, you know, customer, healthcare client for the CRM, we're getting bad, you know, we're getting bad NPS. 
Well, your product team could go figure out why that is. And you might just discover they're just not great customers. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, let's change our marketing and let's stop targeting these folks. And then all of a sudden you have a much more efficient and much more effective funnel because you're basically going after those folks who are your super fans, right? Um, and giving up on those kind of anti-personas who just aren't great for you. So yeah, I think that's a good signal. And, and you know, I don't want to, I'm not trying to bash NPS because it's like a religion to a lot of folks. Um, so I don't want to, I don't want to get attacked here, but I think that NPS is one of those things that can be super, super useful when you segment it and then you make decisions as you were alluding to, you know, based on, you know, basically based on that, uh, that experience, if that makes sense. So that's really, really helpful, Patrick. And that's all that I have for today. So thank you so much for the extra time. If people want to learn more about you and your work at ProfitWell, where should they go? Yep. So I'm just PC at ProfitWell.com. Um, sometimes it takes a little bit while for me to kind of get back to you, but I always do eventually. Um, I'm also just Patrick Campbell on LinkedIn. And um, you, know, you can check out ProfitWell.com. We have tons of content that we write on all kinds of stuff like this, um, especially a lot of the benchmarks that I was referencing. Um, and so always happy to help. And thanks for having me. All right. Well, thanks again. And thanks to everyone for watching.